Now it's my pleasure to welcome Christoph Grabner um, on the floor. Christoph is an artificial intelligence scientist and computational chemist at Sanofi Avenides, Deutschland. Christoph supports drug design projects with CAD methods ranging from early heat discovery until lead optimization and candidate selection. Christoph also leads the development and exploration of deep learning and AI-based methods into drug design process for property prediction and de novo design. Prior to Sanofi, Avenides Christoph has, um, was a senior scientist in AstraZeneca, Sweden, and Christoph had uh, his PhD in theoretical chemistry at the University of Würzburg, Deutschland. <coughs> Welcome, uh, Christoph. The title of the talk is AI in drug discovery, what do we need for um, being successful? We all want to hear it. Oh, okay, come. thanks a lot. <laughs> I, so I hope you can hear me fine. Okay, so thanks a lot for the nice introduction and also thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me here to uh, give a presentation. And so as mentioned, I want to talk about how we, we apply AI and artificial intelligence in drug discovery particularly in small molecule drug design, and uh, want to highlight or want to uh, go into a, some parts or some topics which are um, particularly important to, to take care of. So if we look at the usual application of AI in drug design, we can nowadays see um, what we heard in early talks uh, today as well, is that AI algorithms are now routinely applied in various stages of the drug design process. And there are a lot of different success stories, in particular for property prediction, but also uh, in uh, generative design in developing or finding new uh, molecules. There are several quite well-established scenarios where and how we can use AI. Nevertheless, there are some key gaps which we want to need to address or which we need to take care of or, or look at. And this brings me to a short outline of my talk. So first, I give a short introduction for, of AI and drug design, in, with a particular focus on small molecule drug design, and to discuss some key components or see, uh, key parts uh, which are important for AI-based de novo design. And then um, check more on current, and then <laughs> check more on uh, current uh, gaps, um, which are there in the small molecule drug design uh, area, and which we want to address, which is, for example, understanding and quantifying predictions make the right molecules, so how we can guide the design, and also improve our capabilities in predicting properties in the low data regime. If we look at AI and drug design, we first also have to take, or also have to look at the value chain in the development of a small molecule. So first, of course, we have to find a new target, we have to uh, see or check if that molecule or that target is draggable, and then that's the area where we usually work uh, most of the time, is we want to see how we can find a new lead structure and optimize that lead structure towards a preclinical or a clinical candidate. This molecule is then progressed in, in a clinical phase to, to finally get a drug, but in the lead discovery and optimization phase, there are a lot of different uh, applications where we use AI. It can be, for example, synthesis planning, property predictions and QSA models, and there we get more and more large data sets across different chemical series for ATME property predictions and anti-targets. And of course, we also want to do generative AI to actually use all this data to generate new molecules. If we do that, we of course need to um, generate and gather all the data we have into in silico models for the prediction of certain properties That's, uh, that we need to actually um, cover or design and guide uh, the generation of new molecules, and all of the data needs to be integrated to drive the design towards optimized uh, molecules. Usually, in this drug design process, we work in a so-called design, make, test, analyze cycle. So that's an iterative cycle where we first design and make new molecules, we test them, gather new data, analyze them, and then use that for doing a next conclusion or the next uh, step. When you want to use AI in that particular process, we also, of course, need to generate and gather the data and use that in a more or, way, more or less automatic way to guide a multi-parameter optimization 
process. For the predictive QSAR models, I only want to shortly mention that we usually have a quite large panel of available models, which is trained on all the data we have internally. We're using a variety of different descriptors that can be either um, classical fingerprints, physical, uh, physchem property, uh, properties, but also um, graph convolutional neural networks. And these are then trained and merged together to build uh, a variety of different models, which we can actually use to guide uh, the design. So what are the key challenges if you want to use generative AI, in particular in drug design? Of course, one of the uh, hardest topics is that drug discovery is intrinsically a multi-parameter optimization challenge. So it's not enough to just optimize affinity or the activity towards one specific target, but we need to take care of a variety of different uh, properties. We want to be selective, but we also want to be stable. It needs to be soluble, or it also needs to be, of course, safe. So typically, we, we are optimizing parallel, um, several properties in parallel, and we want to optimize the one property without losing uh, another property. And for that, we are using uh, all data we have and uh, in silico models to actually guide the design. Something which was already mentioned earlier today is that one key problem, of course, is that in vivo data is particularly sparse. So if we want to translate from in vitro and PK and in vitro data towards in vivo, that's a key problem at the, at the moment as well. We then finally also want to incorporate all uh, knowledge into the design um, to have either appropriate starting points, but also want to use a different, um, for example, 3D or physics-based approaches to actually guide design. Uh, last but not least, the chemical space is extremely vast. We heard that uh, already today as well. And it offers a lot of different possibilities what kind of molecule you want to make. So finally, we also need to um, see and, and, and rank all the different uh, potential opportunities which we can explore and prioritize uh, our molecules. In that sense, if we look at generative AI in, in drug design, we can um, basically um, digitalize the design make test cycle. So we have to make, design and make new molecules. For that, we need to have some kind of molecular uh, generators which are able to sample um, new molecules. And all of these molecules needs to be evaluated and ranked where we usually have a large panel of different methods um, uh, integrated that you can nicely uh, push your generation towards the space where you actually want to be. In particular, if you look at different um, scoring functions or reward functions for such a generation, this, these can range from simple ligand-based uh, approaches like 2D and 3D similarity. And 2D similarity is particularly uh, uh, successful if you want to, for example, just generate analogs of uh, of your starting points, but if you want to be, want to find something new, you want to find new uh, chemical entities, you also have to do a scaffold hopping, so you have to have large changes in the molecule. There, we need more fuzzy descriptors, for example, 3D similarity, or even going into 3D docking directly into the generation process, and of course, also integrate all the different machine learning models in uh, the complete multi-parameter optimization. In our way, we are coupling all this together in a generative AI design toolbox because in our view, we want to have some kind of a workflow which can run more or less automatically. So at the bottom, we have our panel uh, of scoring function which can be adapted to each of the different uh, profiles or the each different um, uh, project needs. And on the top, we have a variety of different generation models they can range from uh, language models like RNNs or even transformer or transformer methods um, via autoencoders and also fragment-based re reinforcement learning. But also, um, we usually include classical MATCAM transformation and matched molecular pair analysis because these usually include quite a lot of inf uh, informative and important information which can be pooled all together. In this final um, generation cycle or reinforcement learning approaches, we generate uh, molecules, these are evaluated using the project data, and then feed back into the compound generation to learn from the actual data. 
Um, so, so why do you actually think that we need such a variety of different generation and evaluation tools? Um, we did some comparison using uh, several scoring functions and, generate, and generation methods uh, here on the left and the right. And you can basically nicely see that uh, most often or very often the um, generation or different type of methods cluster around in some areas of the chemical space. So for example, on the top right, there's uh, the transfer learning, uh, reinforcement learning with, uh, with transfer learning, which is one area of the chemical space. So by pooling all of this together, you have a, the highest probability of actually covering um, the, a large variety of the chemical space. Um, with that, these are quite a lot of methods which are more or less well established and we use them on a more, uh, more or less routine um, base to, to generate new ideas and generate new methods. However, if we have um, predictions of, or if we have um, <clears throat> a, a property prediction for a specific um, property, we also want to understand why this, uh, uh, why this prediction is given and what the model actually thinks about that prediction. That's why we use explainable AI in the whole uh, process, um, in the whole process to actually evaluate and check uh, the different um, analysis or the different predictions we have. So what is explainable AI? Explainable AI is uh, some uh, class of methods which are trying to actually evaluate deep neural networks and see if they are, uh, or, or see or, or evaluate why a certain prediction is given by a certain model. So it's in the end, we want to remove the black box character of the neural network prediction. This would allow us, or this allows us to understand why a prediction is given and also see if the prediction is given for the right or wrong uh, reason. So <clears throat> what are the reasons that a model thinks this molecule should be active or it's inactive? This kind of evaluation also helps to build trust in the predictions and finally let the chemists who are using the predictions see and work with uh, these uh, data to generate new molecules. So how is this usually done or what's one of the methods which you can use? One famous method in that area is the SHAP method and that method usually goes into the prediction and evaluates each single feature and tries to find out what's the importance of the different features. And instead of just getting a prediction, like here uh, the, the picture is a rooster, it actually gives you a heat map or it gives you a contribution of each single feature why the network actually think that's, uh, that's a rooster. And this method, usually applied to image recognition, is also applied now to um, molecules or to, to property predictions using uh, molecular fingerprints, for example, and we evaluated these methods here in one particular uh, application example. So here you can see a factor 10a uh, structure, the binding mode of that structure with some key interactions. You can see the indole ring here, which is very important in some uh, residues or resident, res, uh, residues here, here and here. These are very important to actually drive uh, the activity in that, um, in that binding pocket. So to evaluate if we can use XAI for actually analyzing these predictions or using them for designing new molecules. We built uh, deep neural network models using ECFP4 fingerprints, and you can basically just see statistics of the model. So here, so we had around 3,800 molecules, highly profiled for that specific target, which allows us to actually build a quite uh, <coughs> reliable or a quite good model um, for this data set, and at the top, you can actually see three examples. So in the middle, you have the most active molecules within uh, that particular series. And you can also see that uh, the predictions, while um, a little bit off, so, so it's not actually the, the absolute value is not correct, but the relative values between these three predictions is actually pretty good. So it allows you to rank and classify the molecules to be very active, medium active, and not so active. But in the end, if you just use a prediction, you would stop here. So you do not know why the model actually thinks that that molecule is not that active as before. So we mapped back the explanations from the SHAP method on the molecule using the fingerprints. And you actually uh, see that a green contribution basically means that it's a positive contribution towards the prediction. So the model thinks these kind of features or these fingerprints 
um, increase the activity, while a red, um, a red area would indicate a negative contribution towards the prediction. So what you can nicely see that the molecule in the middle is all green, so uh, with respect in the model, it has nothing to complain around that molecule. And um, basically, that's also quite clear because it's the most active molecule in the whole data set. So there is no reference anymore, which is more active. So the model cannot just think putting something here would increase uh, the activity. However, if we remove the nitrile and the methyl group, like we have done on the molecule on the right, it actually highlights the indole ring to say, look, at that position, something is not so good. You, take, you should maybe look at this in more detail. In a second example, we also um, evaluated if that could be, for example, applied to ATME properties. So for that uh, particular example, we rebuilt some of our sanofi herc models using fingerprints. Usually we're using uh, graph convolutions for that model, but for that example, we used uh, fingerprint uh, models. And the nice part here for these two pairs, which is terfenadine and fexofenadine. So terfenadine is pretty known that it has some HERC liabilities, and it highlights that this tertiary butyl group is one of the key drivers for the HERC activity. Of course, also the amine in the middle, and that's both of these two parts are highlighted or um, mapped pretty red in this prediction model. But if we use, if we add this carboxylic group here to actually in, uh, decrease the HERC activity, we see that this part is also nicely covered or nicely uh, visualized by the model. And that's also the case for the example below, where removing that methyl group actually decreases the HERC activity. So while we now can understand why a model is uh, giving a certain predictions, it's also interesting to see um, if the model is actually certain about the, the prediction. So one key question as well is, which we need to address, or which is very important to actually use uh, property predict predictions to see if you, if you get a predictions, if the model is actually certain that that prediction might be correct or is not correct. So we're using uh, uncertainty methods to quantify the model re reliability. And most often, of course, you have some kind of applicability domain. So you check if the molecule you want to predict is inside of your training data set or outside. But these, um, uh, uh, these checks usually have uh, some limitations. So the model also makes some kind of errors. This can be, for example, noise in the experimental data, but it can also be the coverage of the chemical space. So you don't have enough data around that uh, molecule. Although maybe you've, you have, for example, one or two similar molecules, but it's not enough to make a certain or accurate prediction. And of course, most uh, difficult, you might also have activity cliffs. So for example, that all molecules are inactive in a certain area of space and you're adding one specific methyl group and magically that mo molecule is uh, highly active. So we, wanted, we want to know or want to see if we can get more confidence or if the model can actually tell us if it's certain about its uh, predictions. And there are a variety of methods available which you can use for actually predicting the uncertainty. One of them, uh, some of them are the Monte Carlo dropout method. We actually modify the loss of the neural network or the, um, the loss of the neural network to actually get uh, a prediction or get an ensemble of predictions and see how large is the deviation of these predictions. You can use Gaussian process regression, which is Bayesian regression approach, which usually in, is inherently produces an uncertainty estimation. And another commonly used method is conformal predictions, where you actually build a second regression model, which learns to predict um, the error. If you look at uh, these kind of predictions, you usually have to keep in mind that the, the prediction itself is basically just the maximum here, but you usually have a probability or a distribution of these predictions, and the width of the distribution gives you the certainty or uncertainty of the model. What we want to see is something, uh, is, is something like these points up here, so that the model, if the model is doing a large error, it actually should if, also give us a large uncertainty, so that we can actually track down predictions which are, which are potentially wrong or right. And then finally, the, um, if, you, if we start to remove uh, molecules or predictions which are very uncertain, we want to, uh, want to see that the model actually gets better um, over time. 
And actually, uh, by evaluating uh, the, the different methods on project data sets and also ATBI properties over a long period of time, so these are all uh, prospective um, predictions gathered over one and a half year, um, where we at each time point predicted the new molecules and pooled all results uh, together. And you can see that if we start to remove um, the predictions or the, uh, yeah, start to remove those predictions with a high uncertainty, the error of the models is decreased. Um, you can also see that there's quite a difference between uh, the different projects or the different uh, data point, um, endpoints and also the different methods. But in the end, uh, usually re reducing or removing predictions with high uncertainty re really increases or reduces the error of the um, predictions. So in that sense, we also wanted to see when do the models actually get wrong. So can we track down that a model is getting wrong to, uh, to, due to specific reasons? So if we have uh, the whole data set here, we can actually see that there are a lot of predictions which are actually pretty good, but you have a certain number of outliers. If we just look at those uh, predictions which actually do not have any neighbor in the data set, you can, see, you can see that these include quite a lot of uh, and quite a lot of points which have a very large error. So if you do not have any neighbors in the training data, this increases, of course, the risk of mispredictions. And, and likewise, if we have uh, molecules which are uh, very different in their activities, so have actually an activity cliff, you can see that these really include a lot of different wrong predictions, and that's also uh, not surprising that if all molecules are inactive and you finally have one molecule which is active, that this molecule is very hard to predict for a model. And in that sense, we also want to see, um, can we see when the models get uncertain for these kind of, uh, um, for these kind of um, application fields? And in fact, we can see that on the plots on the left for two different models, we can see that if we do not have any neighbors, uh, the uncertainty is increased quite a lot. So yes, uh, missing neighbors can nicely be captured by the uncertainty methods. However, activity cliffs um, are still very uh, scattered along all predictions. So still, the uncertainty methods usually have problems um, to predict or accurate, accurately predict and capture if an activity cliff is there or not. So it doesn't really know if the prediction is good or bad. So if we have now models with uncertainty, what can we actually do with that? One part is, of course, judge the predictions, so also communicate with the project chemists to say, look, this prediction is good, but it has a high uncertainty. But we can also guide the design or uh, the selection of testings using active learning. With active learning, the key idea is that we do not choose um, the next molecules for testing ourselves, but we let, a, let an algorithm choose which molecule should be taken for, uh, for the next test round. And usually you can have two different application scenarios. It can be an explorative uh, fashion where we want to learn the right model. So we have a quite diverse selection and, um, and an uncertainty-based selection, and we expect that the model is improved over time with less uh, amount of data needed. And once we have such a right model, we go into an exploitive mode, so, so we do not want to improve the model any, anymore, but we want to improve uh, uh, the, the, the activity or the potency in my specific target, so we only use those actives or those molecules which are actually predicted towards the direction we want to have. And we internally developed, together with our uh, digital R&D group, uh, a novel, uh, a new technique, which is called CoveGrop, which you can see here, and the key idea is that, that you basically use an uncertainty but also a covariance, covariance uh, of the uncertainty. So not only using those molecules which are most uncertain but also couple this to actually most broadly coverage of the chemical space to say you want to select those molecules which are most uncertain but also uh, highest or also show a highest distribution. So we're using that model, uh, this uh, model or this method now to, active, to, to actually work on real-world applications to have a strategic selection of compounds for the next testing round. So in principle, in theory, that looks like we have a new set of molecules which require 
uh, some UTB profiling. So we want to, for example, know the metabolic stability for these molecules. So then based on the active learning strategy, we select a subset of the molecules for experimental testing. So for example, 20% of the molecules is selected for testing. And we only test those molecules and then predict the remaining molecules. And finally, after several rounds of optimization, we hope that the model is converging to something which is much better um, or equally good than the whole model, but using less uh, data. So we have uh, some first steps in these applications already finished, but usually as timelines in a drug design process are pretty slow, we, we, uh, there's quite some long waiting times until you actually gather all the different data points. And you also have to convince chemists to actually say, test these molecules. It's not your favorite molecule, but we want that test because the algorithm tells us we want that test. But in the end, we selected these uh, for the whole uh, couple of molecules. We only selected those red molecules by the active learning process and then start and, and then rebuild the model using just the molecules from the active learning and predicted the remaining data with the original model and the active learning model. And we can nicely see that the correlation actually was improved uh, quite, quite a lot. So we will see how we actually um, will progress um, with this method. So I see I have five minutes left. So we'll skip uh, the next topic with low data um, predictions and then conclude how we actually use all of these different methods um, to integrate that into uh, the drug design process. So for us, it's very important to actually say we want to use generative AI and different property predictions in the integration into the drug design process. So for that, we say we want to have a more or less automated design and ideation workflow, which we simply call the digital team member because we want to have that one integrated and augmenting the drug design team to say it's automatically suggesting new design ideas and we want to use these new design ideas in the uh, drug design process. So how have we set up that procedure? So each time a project is getting new uh, or novel new project data, which is usually on a bi-weekly or four-weekly base, we update all the machine learning models specific or specific to that project, so the activity models, for example. We then profile all of the molecules and use the most recent and active inhibitors as starting points and seeds for AI-based de novo design and couple that also to classical MedChem transformations and matched molecular pair models which are trained for that specific project. That, of course, creates a large amount of different molecules and different design ideas. So we are doing a post-processing using a, large, a larger panel of machine learning models to actually filter it down to the most uh, relevant or the most or the highest, the, 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 the most interesting set of molecules, which is then more or less uh, the suggestion of molecules from the digital team member. And this is passed to the project teams where we together and uh, collectively prioritize the ideas for the next, for the synthesis, which is then, in our view, the human intelligence, how they actually those both worlds work together. Some of these molecules you might actually synthesis directly because you say that's a really good suggestion. Others you see that part of the molecule is, for example, very interesting, so we want to integrate them into other series or generate new ideas. And sometimes you simply follow them up in virtual libraries to see is there something, for example, in the real space, uh, something which can be synthesized very quickly or easily without spending too much uh, effort. In one example, we are using this workflow very regularly and we actually search for novel compounds with cellular activity. So we can see here that we have several starting points, for example, in that particular sense from an HTS, some high throughput screen, which shows decent activity but was cellularly completely inactive. So using uh, all the data we had at the time point and using our AI-based design engine, we actually came up with one candidate which actually uh, was more stable and uh, showed a nice cellular activity. And then in concluding steps in the med chemist, in the uh, medicinal chemistry team and AI-gated design, we extended that hit to become one of the candidates uh, for our lead uh, structures. And in that project, we see that the predictivity of key target and uh, admin models is 
around more than 80%, and more than 20 compounds are directly synthesized from AI, but also various compounds are really inspired or guided by that. So we really see that augmenting MedChem designs with ideas from AI is pretty uh, efficient. So also here, we can see that most design compounds are actually fully profiled in silico before we actually make them. So this allows us to really prospectively track uh, the performance of the models in that sense, uh, in, in that context, and the predictive models are available to all project chemists by themselves. So each design idea they do, they can actually profile in silico before they think if they make them or not. In our vision, we also want to include the uncertainty and active learning-based methods directly into the AI design part and augment this uh, process as much as possible. With that, I want to summarize um, my talk. So we, we see that AI-based de novo design really starts to be well established in drug design. Nevertheless, to, to us, it's, it's really an aug augmented design or an augmented approach that you use AI design, for example, as a tool to gather or generate new ideas and use them together in the, the project um, or in the drug design projects. And it's important to have a panel of generation and evaluation methods, and it's most important to streamline and design workflows, which is um, efficiently, or, or makes it more efficiently to apply these methods in drug design. And current uh, uh, addressing of current key gaps is also in, in progress. And with that, I want to thank uh, all different contributors uh, to this um, work and to these slides, and you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> that, that was amazing, especially your team member, AI. Must be very smart. All right, so um, <laughs> uh, questions. Please come to the microphone. Thank you uh, for your fantastic talk. So you mentioned the digital team member for low data problem. So my question is like, uh, for this application and even for active learning applications, can we use Swarm AI that is a population of agent-based algorithms and even incorporation of evolutionary algorithm and the genetic algorithm into the populations of agent-based models. So as we have a hierarchical structure and evolutional property of the ensemble of AI system compared to, an in, to enhance the digital team members' performance. Mm -hmm. So you mean using more and more uh, other algorithms like uh, genetic algorithms and things like that as well? Yeah. Yes, uh, that's uh, sure that's valid uh, ideas. And that's basically we, we use and integrate all kinds of methods which are actually helpful like match molecular pairs as well. So yes, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. How do you deal with the problem that molecule generators tend to predict, to produce really silly molecules that exploit your scoring function? Yeah, very good question. I, I think that's one of the key uh, problems for all of these, uh, for, for the generative design because they try to really fool uh, the scoring uh, function. So uh, one approach which we uh, evaluated that you have some kind of applicability domain for um, the generation itself, so, so not for the model applicability, but for the um, generated uh, molecules to, to basically see if they are still in the chemical space you are actually um, interested. And other possibilities um, are usually also including, for example, the applicability domain of the models in the design to actually see if you diverge too much from the applicability, so your training data set, you completely neglect these kind of molecules. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that there are come some kind of uh, balances and drawbacks because if you say you want to be close to the chemical space, you know it's hard to jump away, but if you jump away too much, then you are outside of the applicability domain. So in, in principle, it's a little bit of a trade-off and, and, and drawback how you actually do this, but in general, using the applicability domain and the chemical space, which you actually cover and see that you are not diverging uh, too much. All right, thanks. Yeah, I think there are just some fundamental notions of chemical stability mm -hmm. that aren't being captured right now. Yes, yeah, especially in these language uh, models. Yes. So in this fragment-based generation, this is much more safe yeah. and um, 
we're also working on uh, using chemistry oriented fragment based generation, for example, not splitting molecules just by some standard rules, by actually using retrosynthetic rules and building blocks to split the molecules. And with these kind of uh, techniques, you're staying much closer to an actually reasonable chemical space. But, but yeah, all other uh, suggestions are very welcome because I think Thanks. that's one of the key problems for generation. <clears throat> so one question on the Doom, uh, why would removing data with high uncertainty improve performance of the model? In active learning, adding data which is most uncertain provides the most improvement to the model. So yeah, that's the question. Uh, okay, okay. So, so, so in principle, so, so removing those basically only improves the model if the uncertain prediction makes sense. So basically that's some kind of testing that the uncertainty makes um, sense because, so, so in the end, if a model makes a prediction and it's very uncertain about that prediction, um, that prediction has a high probability of being wrong. So, so then, in the end, if you use all these predictions, the, the, the general error or correlation is, is, is higher. And if you start removing um, predictions with a high uncertainty, you're more focusing on predictions where the model is quite sure and certain that the prediction is correct and that decreases um, uh, the error of the models. Also, of course, it also decreases the applicability of the model because you're removing a fraction of, of the space which you actually can predict. In the active learning setting, if you particularly use those molecules which are highly uncertain and test them, you're giving that, this information to the model which it basically asks you uh, to, 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 pro to provide it. So just, just imagine if you have 10 molecules and, and the model says these five molecules I can predict pretty certain and I know, I know enough around these molecules um, to say I, I'm certain about the predictions. There's not much point or not much sense to say I'm give you more of these molecules. But if it's telling you these molecules I don't really know what I should do with them, then it's good to provide these molecules actually to the data set and include them in the data set to, to improve basically the, the coverage of the chemical space you are working on. All right, so we'll take one last question. Uh, when we're talking about uncertainty, uh, so you said if there are not enough samples closer to, uh, or maybe let's say not enough samples within a cluster, how do you quantify that? Like how do you identify if two compounds are closer to each other or they belong to a cluster? Um, in, in that particular analysis, we are simply calculating yeah. the, the similarity based on a, on a fingerprint. So that's... Like what basis did you use? What cutoff did you use to prove um, that? The, the cutoff here, so we used uh, ECFP4 Morgan type fingerprints, so, so uh, radius two, and a similarity threshold of 0 0.6 to say if it's below 0 0.6, then we say that's away, and if it's above 0 0.6, then we say it's close enough. But that's basically just some uh, uh, threshold. So in the uncertainty evaluation itself, there's no such a threshold because it's just coming out of the model. Okay. Excellent. Let's thank Christoph one more time. Yes.